Ladies and gentlemen, Making Michigan More Competitive is sponsored by Business Leaders for Michigan. Please welcome Awanate Kavana, Chief Executive Officer of Bedrock Manufacturing Company and Chairman of Michigan Economic Development Corporation Executive Committee. Maureen Krause, President and Chief Executive Officer of Detroit Regional Partnership. Sandy Pierce with Huntington Bank. Doug Song, Chief Strategy Officer of Cisco Secure and co-founder of Duo Security. And to moderate the discussion, Paul W. Smith, host of WJR News Talk, 760 AM. All right, we've, uh, we've had a long, uh, well, it's been a long weekend, week, and it's been a great week, and going into this weekend. Pretty happy with the weather here? Pretty. So, uh, Mayor Archer, you remember when it snowed when we were up here. Right? So it's a, it's a beautiful week we've had, and I think it's been a beautiful conference, and I thank Sandy Barua and all of his hardworking team and staff. They've done a great job. All right, we come here with a simple question that, boy, if we can answer this, we'll have accomplished a lot. The question is, what do we do to make Michigan more competitive. What do we do to stop hearing about major companies, including some of our own, going elsewhere to expand? We need it to happen here. So what are we going to do to make Michigan more competitive? You've already met these folks as they've come on the stage, so I'm just going to go right to Maureen. Uh, we just finished a lunch discussion focused on uh, Michigan's economic competitiveness with amazing folks like yourself. And like, uh, well, John Rakulta, Congressman uh, Debbie Dingle was here, Matt Cullen, a whole bunch of folks. So share a brief summary of what we heard and the ideas suggested that rose to the top of your list, Maureen. Thanks, Paul W. It's terrific to be here. You know, the main conversation that I think we all had was around talent. We have terrific talent here. Second largest number of engineers in the country. Our manufacturing talent is very experienced but we don't have enough of it. It's not a unique problem to Detroit. So how do we keep the talent we have and how do we make our talent smarter and more able for the jobs of the futures? I would say that was a main theme of what we heard. We have Sandy Pierce to thank for putting the topic of Michigan's economic competitiveness into this agenda of the conference this year. Sandy, what pushed you to ensure that we talk about economic competitiveness this year. What was it, Sandy? It, what, the example that I want to give, we can all look at other states that we've heard that companies even that are headquartered here have gone to. And the example that I want to give is where our company, Huntington Bank, is headquartered in, in Columbus, Ohio. And they entered the RFP process for Intel in May. And in seven months, they won a $20 billion investment for the largest chip manufacturer in the world in Columbus, Ohio. So that's why I became so interested in, it's not the weather, what are they doing that Michigan isn't? Number one, they had a great site that offered infrastructure and that offered flexibility for growth beyond the site that they needed. 926 acres that was put together by a private entity, a private entity. And they had heavy and reliable power near them, and they had water and wastewater capacity. Number two, strong workforce and talent commitments. Every engineering college in Ohio committed to providing graduates to Intel. Every community college in Ohio and every technical college joined up to participate, not compete with each other, participate. Jobs Ohio has succeeded regardless of who was in the administration, who was in the governor's office. Not always easy, there were obstacles that they overcame on every administration. But that is talent acquisition incentive, Jobs Ohio. Number three, incentives. The Ohio legislature passed a mega project incentive in last year's budget before Intel. 
allowed property tax abatements and the job creation tax credit to go to 30, a 30 year term. And finally, speed. And Ambassador Rakulta talks about this all the time, the cohesiveness in that state, regardless of your party affiliation, the private and public partnerships, it won what will be, is predicted, to be a, to be a hundred billion dollar of investment in that area and 500,000 new residents over the next 10 years. Good things to think about for sure. <laughs> uh, Awanate, in addition to your day job at Bedrock, you also chair the MEDC, so uh, you're all development all the time. From the MEDC's perspective, what is Michigan doing right in the fight to attract and retain employers in Michigan, and where do you think Michigan needs to do more? Thank, thank, thanks for the question, Paul. It, it's a lot of what um, the MEDC does right is indicative and shown by some of the projects that we've gotten recently. Uh, with the leadership of the new CEO, Quentin Messer Jr., some of the senior leaders that we've added over time uh, more recently, and the team that was there before, I believe that the MEDC has really been able to find their sweet spot uh, with getting big projects and getting small projects as well. Um, small business has been a focus since the beginning of the pandemic, and that will continue as well. As Sandy mentioned, there, there are also things that not just the MEDC, but we as a state can do better, both private, public, uh, governmental, nonprofit, and it starts really with a, with a clear vision. What a vision that we can articulate and execute upon, because I think everyone agrees that we, Michigan wants to win. We want to win projects, we want to grow the population, we want jobs, we want great lives, but we have to be able to first articulate a vision, develop a strategy that involves education and economic development. And when I say education, it's everything from pre-kindergarten to 12, it's university, uh, it's workforce development, and then looking at some of the things Sandy said about speed, making sure that we have all the players at the table developing tactics, and not just government, but including government, because those of you that have been coming to this conference for many years will realize there's been versions of this conversation for, for decades. And so we need to pick now as the moment where we're going to show resolve to solve these issues. Finally, uh, this is an issue that is not just uh, uh, competing with our other states in this great country. We're competing with the world now mm -hmm. for business and opportunity. So I'm going to ask a gentleman who has a lot of experience in that area, Doug Song, uh, who works at Cisco, which of course is national and international. From your perspective, Doug, is Michigan competitive? And if not, why not? So I think we have a larger role to play, particularly in the new jobs, the new economy of technology, innovation, and so forth, than we actually get credit for. Right? People don't generally think in tech of uh, Michigan essentially as a growth state. And I think it's evidenced by the fact that we have not actually grown our population and so forth. Um, but another day, they actually think of, of auto actually as a tech industry, which actually is. The, the big challenge, though, is that as the World Economic Forum, they just had a, a report on the, on the f uh, future of jobs. There's 75 million jobs that will be displaced by technology, with 133 million new jobs being created that are digital. And we have to fight harder for the jobs that remain in manufacturing. Our, our manufacturing levels are back up, but with a third less jobs. And in some cases, you know, like an EV, as many of you know, it takes 30% less labor to actually develop. So we have to fight harder for not just the jobs that we have, but for the jobs of the future. And those really are driven by technology innovation. If you look at you know, uh, what Jobs Ohio, Ohio X are doing, they're talking about the fact that the economy of the future for Ohio is being driven by technology innovation. We have all that here. But we don't bear that reputation in many respects for, um, again, how folks think about us. And so I think there's a lot more that we have to do to line up a reputation for Michigan as a hub for technology and for innovation. There's a lot of concern about this. In fact, somebody at the luncheon earlier when we were saying it's a conversation about making Michigan more competitive, they said this is a crisis. 
We're in a crisis. Do I want to hear what you guys say about that? Just speak up. You know, I, I like what you just said, but we, we have to worry about K through 12. And when you look at where we stand in the state of Michigan, let's let's not go global right now. Let's just stay in the United States of America. We are 33rd in the eighth grade math scores, 39th in fourth grade reading. We're 41st in high school graduation. We have to invest in our children for the jobs of the future. And we have to have them graduate and want and give them a path for jobs that will be available. And, but people aren't gonna come to the state when they look at those statistics and they don't have the talent here. So one thing, I'll add Paul W. And, and building on that, it's that investment. As a state, we have not invested for a long time in many things, improving our infrastructure, investing in K through 12 through our university system. We've spent money, that's true, but we haven't invested to improve it. You know, when you build a house, and I think about when my parents built their house, we sold it 50 years later, nothing was original on the house. Things had been upgraded through the years and improved, and we need to do that in every component of our state to show businesses that we are interested in our foundational infrastructure that they want to invest in. We haven't done that. And the other piece that's been touched on that we really need to spend time on is this thought about getting along, as Awanate said. We all agree, I guarantee every person at this conference agrees we want better jobs for our residents and we want more investment in our state. So that's our foundation. Let's build on that foundation and see how we get to be the state that people want to come to, that companies want to come to. Uh, we've kind of lost that vibe, and I don't know if we've just taken things for granted or we've thought, well, it's good enough for now. It should never be that way. We have to look at investing and having the thought that we should always be looking to do better. The, the two things that you said, investment and getting along, are actually related. You, you can't make the investment unless you're getting along, right? When, so when you go to other states, and I've talked to friends that have competed for jobs and had RFPs, states that you wouldn't believe based on the rancor publicly show up with their, their governor, the leader of their state house, and the leader of their state senate all talking about come to X state. And that, that doesn't necessarily happen here all the time, uh, or rarely ever. And so to make sure that you have that investment, whether it's education, economically, workforce, talent, all the things that we named, you have to have that spirit of collaboration. I think one thing that is important to note is that you know, for those jobs of the future, right? even now, pre-pandemic, one out of 67 jobs, according to LinkedIn's chief economist, were actually remote. But post-pandemic, currently, one out of every seven jobs posted is actually remote. Place matters more than ever. And I think we have not done enough to really again, build the kind of aligned vision of what we want this place to be at a time where, again, folks are wondering, are someone going to kidnap our governor and, you know, all this. It's, it's, um, mm -hmm. It is a race to the bottom, you know, uh, when we're all only having conflict, you know, East versus West, Union versus um, management, uh, Black versus White. We do have to come together in ways, again, that, uh, again, demonstrate that we're all in it to win. But look at, look at what we do have in Michigan, and I like to repeat some of the stats. I mean, we have 11,000 inland lakes. We have 19 million acres of trees. We put the world on wheels. We have the best engineering talent in this country, and we control 30% of the freshwater surface. So those are pretty good natural resources and human resources to, to brag about and to attract people if we can come together. Arts, culture, sports, we have so much. Right. Well, then it comes back down to, then what the heck's going on? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> sounds great to me, but I live here. Right. Uh, yeah. what, what are we losing? Uh, from your vantage point, how, what do these other places have that we don't? That's even uh, having some of our own people, students and workers, become attracted to other places and go there. It, it's interesting, as a rel we were talking backstage, as a relatively new transplant to Michigan, I had never thought about coming to Michigan for tourism or, uh, or livelihood um, prior to coming. And I, I came for a job and I'm still here six years later and I, I, I love it and I'm, I'm here on stage, so thank you for having me. Um, but the, the thing that we are missing is not, there's not a one size fits all solution, right? There's many different 
populations of talent, some of whom come here for two or four years for university and then some of whom leave, people that grew up here and went through the K through 12 school system and then moved along, or others like Doug and I that grew up somewhere else and would, and would stay. So you can't have one, a one size fits all solution, but people want a lot of the same things. They want to have a good life. They want to have a good job. They want to have mobility. They want leisure activities. And those are things that we have parts of, but we need to create a, a vision of the life that they could have that enables them to come join us. And I think when you look at, especially on the stage, many of us have lived in other places. I've lived in Arizona and Indiana and Illinois. And having that perspective and seeing how other states do things really helps you understand what we could do better. It is that all being on the same page as one team Michigan, um, it's really important. I've been privileged to do international work where I've had businesses in China and India say, we want to be the Detroit of China or we want to be the Detroit of India. And I thought, can I bring you home with me so we can all believe that? Because we have to build on the assets we have. It doesn't mean we're not working really hard to fix the ones that need to be fixed. And I think having um, our leadership, our uh, political leadership, our business leadership all on that same page is going to be really important so our residents believe that we have assets that are valuable to others and we can build on them. Just as an example, I think you know, we, we, we need to find the political will to actually seek a shared success that's larger than ourselves. In other states, we see things like you know, 500 million in Indiana that they, they deployed across 92 counties for placemaking. Um, we opened an office in Austin, Texas, where they passed a $7 billion millage for public transit just in that one city. I mean, we couldn't pass a $4 billion millage across four counties here for, for the same. We, we have a lot of these things I think we, we need to figure out how to come together with, on and as, as political coalitions. And for me, that is, uh, that's why we're here. Right? We have to find the right intersection of business, politics, and society, philanthropic sector as well as nonprofits, to really solve these pressing problems in ways that we can all agree with in a highly polarized time. You know, uh, I want to you had said uh, about the idea of these other states that are going for businesses, putting a unified face forward, uh, bipartisan, unified face forward. And one of the things we picked up from our earlier discussion was the, the companies feel sometimes there's too much uncertainty in Michigan. And part of that is term limits. You know, you, you get working well with somebody only ones that are well, going to be able but, to do that is us. Okay, but Sandy, and you know this, you wouldn't be as successful as you are if you didn't. We can say these things, but our actions are what speak louder to everybody looking at us around the country. So Paul W., I, you know, I didn't want to give this example, but I think it's just a stark example of what we deal with. In the past year, I've spoken with three companies, two from overseas, one from another state. And you know, I have to say, kudos to Detroit. You are not my first talking point anymore where a company asks, oh, how are things in Detroit? Mayor Duggan, the team, spectacular job. It's not a negative anymore. It no, truly isn't. No. But I'll tell you what is, and you know, you're meeting with a company that wants to invest millions in your state, and their first question is, do you really want to kill your governor in Michigan? How in the world do you start a business conversation with that? No, we don't. But the company starts it with you. I don't start it.
But the company, that's our image. So we have to, I agree with you, Paul W., we have to talk about what we agree on, we have, but we have to learn those lessons and listen to what others think of us and look at other examples and move forward from there. Let's give a round of applause for these folks. Panel number one, we have another panel coming our way. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Joining Paul W. Smith on stage, please welcome Sandy Barua, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Detroit Regional Chamber. Tina Fries Decker, President and Chief Executive Officer of BHSH System. Quinton Messer Jr., Chief Executive Officer of Michigan Economic Development Corporation and President and Chair of Michigan Strategic Fund. And Howard Underleader, President and Chief Financial Officer of Dow. As our conversation continues with a new group of people, they were also together earlier uh, at the luncheon in their groups. They were discussing a lot of different things, the crisis, uh, the talent. Uh, we talked about 300,000 women leaving the workforce in Michigan over the last several years, the uncertainty, the term limits. Uh, there's a heck of a lot that uh, needs to be discussed. I'm sorry, are, are we the B team or you're saving the best for last? I um, just, just want to be clear on I make our clear role here. Nor, I, I did not pick the group, <laughs> nor did I put them in any order whatsoever. <laughs> I'm happy to be helping out the chamber. And I think it was Sandy Baruha that did all of this. I'm just guessing. So I'll start with Sandy. Uh -oh. We're at the chamber uh, conference, the chamber leads our region's economic development agenda. How did the conversation over lunch compare with your thoughts going into the lunch? For one, I'll give you a little help here. I never thought people would look at Michigan and say, I don't want to go to Michigan, they're always fighting. I mean, it never occurred to me, ever. Yeah. Well, listen, in terms of you know what I thought we would hear at the lunch and what we heard at the lunch, it was uh, what I thought we were going to hear turned up to 11. Right, and you know, here's you know, I heard this, and I, well, I'm going to refer to my friend Jeff Donofrio. Lunch, it was uh, what I thought we were going to hear turned up to 11. Right, and you know, here's you know, I heard this, and I, well, I'm going to refer to my friend Jeff Donofrio. You know, we need a handful of things, right? You know, functions that help put that together. And the other good news is, I, you know, my friend Quentin, you know, we stole him from Louisiana, and he's done a <laughs> fabulous job. So two really good things, right? <laughs> but I, you know, but what I heard and, and what I feel, and you know, I'm anxious for everyone else's comments too, is that you know we've got a long way to go. Uh, you know, Jeff Donofrio at lunch talked about you know where is our common shared vision of where our economy is going, what our industry needs, and how are we mapping to that, right? How are we mapping the skills of tomorrow that are where we have competitive advantages? You know, what are we mapping to that, right? How do we, you know, ensure that, A, we make the state more attractive for, you know, especially young, talented people, and how do we, how do we then communicate that uh, to people? Uh, and, then, uh, and then finally, the sense of urgency, and you know, our, all of our friends, uh, John, John Ricolta, uh, has really been pushing on this, which is you know, we need a sense of urgency, we need, uh, we need action, you know, not soon, but sooner than soon, uh, and he's talking about a commission, or, you know, maybe that's the right idea, but whatever we need to do, we need to do something robustly, we need to do something big, and we need to do it quickly, and it needs to be in a bipartisan way. I think the, the way it was summed up, we're, we are, no matter what, playing catch-up. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not always a good position to be in, but it is important to recognize the position we might be in and now do something about it. And we've talked about this. We've talked up on this island for years and years and years about problems. We've walked off this island. Heck, I even had a hat that said we've solved the, ma the mass transit problem in Detroit. I think I got that hat every year. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> be that as it may, we do have uh, the mass transit problem solved now <laughs> in Detroit. We better move on here. Let's uh, go to <laughs> please Tina Fries uh, Decker. Uh, your footprint now extends from one end of the state to the other, so congratulations on the merger and coming out on top as the leader. Clearly, more population means more patience, which is good for Spectrum Beaumont. Is Michigan doing all the right things to create an environment 
that is attractive to both people and businesses from your point of view? Well, I think there's a couple things that we need to do to make sure that we are really successful as a state. And uh, when I think about it, we want to make sure that Michigan is um, a place where people come to live. Let me, I'm sorry, can yeah. you hear her? No. Yeah, uh, hey her folks, can you seem to be on back there? Yeah, so let's fix that. that no, okay. And, and I would go over and lean and put my chest in her face so she could talk to my microphone. But I, this could be misconstrued. Don't, don't do that. Now, no, I, yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe we Not in this day and age. There we go. There we go. Okay. Thank you. There we go. So I think we need to do a lot for our state. Um, we want to make sure that we are a great place where people want to come and live and work and thrive here. And I think that requires us to build upon what we've done for centuries, which is really think about uh, innovation, think about our people, and uh, think about the places that we have. So we need to be more innovative and in connecting with all of our team members to really invest in them and invest in services that allow us to um, partner with businesses and universities to accelerate um, people being embraced and ready to go to work in our fields. One of the things we've been doing is with Grand Valley State University, we actually realized that we need to not just invest in nursing, but we needed to invest in expanding the pipeline. And so we partnered with Grand Valley State University to expand the pipeline of 500 nurses over the next six years. And it took a little give and take on both parties, but we came up with a really innovative approach. And we actually hope that many others copy it because we think it will be really good to expand the pipeline, not just for nursing, but we could do it for other areas. I also think we need to focus on well-being. You know, all of us have team members, and um, there's a significant increase in mental health and mental distress in our workforces. Uh, when I look at the health uh, rankings by state, Michigan is the 42nd state where people have mental distress. And that impacts all of our workers and all of our kids, everybody in our state. And so we need more access to the services, and we've been partnering to figure out how to improve acute care access, but we also need to focus further upstream because we don't want to be dealing with crisis after crisis. We need further prevention and what we're trying to do to address things before it gets to a crisis. And so that's a big effort to make sure that we're taking care of the well-being of our team members, and if we do so, they're going to be more productive, more creative, and more engaging in, in the workforce. And then the third thing I just want to comment on is we need to make sure that our environments are supportive for our team members to come to work every day. That could be creating a belonging and inclusive environment. Um, we know that the environment has a huge impact on the health of people and their productivity. And so we need to make sure that we have environments that support um, people, women, to come to work every day, that they feel like they belong and included in the process. And I think Michigan can do a lot to make sure we're, we are a welcoming and belonging state. Excellent. Uh, Howard, we'd like to ask you, uh, I think they said it in the uh, announcement that uh, Howard Ungerleiter uh, is involved with one of our great uh, international companies that, thank God, continues to stay in Michigan. We really appreciate Dow in every way. Um, as a Fortune 500 leader, uh, you do business all over the globe, as I mentioned. You call Michigan home. Compared to other nations and other states where Dow is, in fact, located, what are Michigan's strengths, and where do you think we fall short from your own experience? Yeah, Paul W. Well, thank, look, thanks for, thanks for, we appreciate you as well, and uh, certainly representing Dow, representing the Great Lakes Bay region, Midland, thank you for everything that you've done. I know you've come to the region quite a bit, last couple of golf tournaments, uh, the Great Lakes Bay Invitational, which is an LPGA event. You've been there live and really appreciate that. Um, I also serve, uh, I have uh, the pleasure of serving uh, as the chair of the Business Leaders for Michigan, um, and we recently put together our Compete to Win plan. Uh, and so just a little, a little plug for everybody. I see Jeff and Ryan and, and this. I'm doing your work, Jeff. Um, go to businessleadersformichigan.com, uh, and the Compete to Win plan is right there. Uh, and it really says we need to focus on four things to be a top 10 state. We need to do better by our kids. We need to invest in our people. Uh, we need to help 
we need to help reinforce and be supportive of Quinton and the MEDC and it really advance uh, economic development. Um, and we've got to get the, the basics right. And I would say, you know, I am an optimist and while there's fighting and all of those things in Michigan and frankly around the world too much, um, we, and we are playing catch up, right? But we are catching up. You know, 12, 15 years ago, Michigan was a, a bottom 10 state across almost every dimension. Today, you know, we are middle of the pack. So we have caught up and we should be very proud of all the work that the governors and the legislature and the business community and all of us, frankly, uh, as citizens have done together to get us to the middle of the pack. That compete to win plan and those four bullet points really will get us to become a top 10 state. And there's really reason to be opportunist, uh, 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 optimistic. If we, if we were a top 10 state today, we would fundamentally have more than 350,000 more jobs. That's the equivalent of all of the US employees of Facebook, Google, and Apple relocating to the state of Michigan. The average household would have more than $11,500 of additional household income. We would be adding about 60 thousand new Michiganders or Michiganians, and I don't want to offend anybody, I'm sure there's some of each of you in the room, but we'd have more than 60,000 new Michiganders every year. That's like a new Royal Oak, or almost 50% larger than Midland every year coming to Michigan. So there's great opportunity, great optimism, but we've got to, we've got to do better. You know, with your golf tournament, <laughs> with uh, the movement festival that just happened back home uh, with the uh, great Chevrolet Detroit Grand Prix on Belle Isle presented by Lear, which will soon be next year downtown Detroit. Every time we come up with one of these uh, must-see events, events that people write on their calendar the year before and say, I'm going to go to Detroit and I'm going to go to that, they come in here and get a whole different perspective of Detroit. We've all seen it, we've all heard it, we've all had people say, wow, I've never seen anything like this. I, this is not what I expected. Chet Huber, the father of OnStar, who's now teaching at uh, Harvard Business School, brought in, I don't know, uh, is Mayor Duggan here? I don't know, 80, like 82, 60, 60. 62 students, 60 students. Well, you did some stuff with him too. Yeah. Uh, of these Harvard Business School kids, brought him in here. They had lunch in the backyard of the Manoogian Mansion. They went in through some of the auto factories. They, uh, uh, Christopher Illich made it possible for them to go to a Tiger ball game. They got a great visit to Detroit. Now those are 60 kids who I can promise you have never thought of Detroit as a potential destination once they get out of Harvard Business School. And I can promise you that some of them now feel that way, and they've already said, because they take these kids around around the world, and they stopped doing it for a couple of years because of the pandemic, so they said, let's start it back, but let's start it in America. Where do we go? And because of Chad Huber, one of the places was Detroit. I thought that was spectacular. I, and I never would have heard about it. I just ran into Chad Huber. We need to talk about some things like that. I suspect Dow has invited students from around the world to see what you do and to do what you do. And Quentin Messer, who uh, Sandy just uh, heaped praise on as he came out from his job in New Orleans, he was a New Orleans superstar. Now he's uh, 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 Detroit, Michigan, and Michigan overall superstar. Uh, he had a stellar record of business attraction in New Orleans, and we're lucky to have you in Michigan. That's a fact. You too, uh, and, and And now that you've been here a while, give us your analysis of Michigan's approach to attracting new businesses and the best practices you want to implement from your previous assignments. Sure, I think maybe there's three things. Um, gratitude is the seed for getting more. So I'm grateful to be sitting on stage with leaders like this, being here at a conf lab. We have some of the best minds globally that are thinking about how to change the marketplace, whether it's healthcare, whether it's uh, research chemicals, financial services, mobility, you name it. So gratitude is a seed for more. So we can't lose perspective on what we have. The second thing are two things that my dad told me. You have to be your own best critic. You have to be relentlessly objective.
but you also be your own best cheerleader. We are very good at being the critic. We must celebrate what we have here. Think about the fact that Dow continues to make investments here in Midland, Michigan. Think about what Tina and her team are doing at BHSF System. They could be doing other things, but they continue to invest in Michigan. We continue to be able to keep Sandy here when all, every chamber, every organization in the world is trying to recruit here. People want to be in Michigan. Yes, there's work to be done. Three quick things. One, we need to win the talent war. We will. I think Tina raised a critical point. When Michigan decides, and I think this is a challenge, to become the best mentally healthy state for entrepreneurs and employees, that's going to be tremendous. Two, there's obviously, we talked about sites. We need to make shovel-ready sites. Ambassador Ricolta, Ray Curry, Congresswoman Dingell wrote a praiseworthy um, op-ed in Cranes. And the final thing, I encourage everyone, please speak life into our great state. We have a wonderful state on two peninsulas. We take a back seat to no one. The last thing I'll say, you never meet a Texan who tells you how crazy Texas is. <laughs> they tell you that God shine brightest on Texas. Everything's bigger and, and better in and, Texas, but, just to ask. But everything is better in Michigan. We have to own and celebrate that. Paul W., maybe just to add a couple, a couple of thoughts to Quinn. I think one of the other things, and, and we're really starting to, to ramp, you know, with the infrastructure spending that we've agreed to do and the big economic development package that we've agreed to do, that's real progress, and I applaud, I applaud the governor and, and the legislature for getting all of that done. But what we also need to do is help support Quentin and have a consistent economic development incentive program that survives through political cycles over the long run because in business you have to have certainty, you have to have consistency, you have to know what you're going to expect before you can invest. And so that's one of the, one of the critical things. And the other thing, and I know Quentin's really working on this, and frankly other states today are doing it better, and that's one of the big reasons why Quentin's here, is to have better overall customer experience, either for businesses or companies that are here that are expanding, or for businesses that we're trying to attract, we have to get better at being a one-stop shop with limited uh, complexities, and that understand that Quinton can have those shovel-ready sites and have those options and those packages available, that whether you're investing in an R&D lab where Dow is in the process, thanks to Quinton's help, we're gonna invest several hundred million dollars of new money uh, into new labs for material science, or whether it's EVs, uh, or anything in between, semiconductors as another key example, we've got, we've got to support Quentin and give the MEDC the ability to provide that capability. Absolutely well put. I appreciate Quentin's comment about gratitude. It is really um, amazing to work with people here in Michigan, and I think there's two things that we can embrace right now to help us with the competitiveness, and that is collaboration across industry, across the entire state, across everything, just really thinking with a full heart of how do we collaborate to get this done, and then have the courage to take the first step and risk some things, try some things out to make sure it's better, because we will never improve if we don't try, even if it's a small step, to move forward. And just a quick last thought, uh, in line with what Sandy Pierce was talking about. We really are what we tell people we are. And we used to tell people we were a mess. When family members or other people would come in to visit, what did people do? They automatically drove around to the worst parts of Detroit and said, see, this is what you've heard on the news. This is, see what I'm talking about? Isn't this terrible? Luckily, we've stopped that. Now we have plenty of great places to take people and show them and brag about our great state of Michigan. We are now all officially deputized to help Pure Michigan, to help Quinton, to tell businesses they're gonna love being in Michigan because we know this is a great place to live, work, stay, and play. Thank you. Please welcome Arne Tellum. Vice Chairman of Piston Sports and Entertainment, 
and chair of the 2022 Mackinac Policy Conference. Got me again. Um, I'm honored to be here and introduce our next featured session, a fireside chat with Emmy Award winning NBC broadcaster, Ann Arbor resident, and Michigan's own Mike Tirico, who's done tremendous work for us this week, and a man who is dear to my heart, Flint, Michigan native, founder and chairman and CEO of Platinum Equity, and Detroit Pistons owner Tom Gorris. It's also great to have, along with Tom, his wife and partner, Holly, 